Hi everybody, welcome to the Azure Data Academy, our follow-up session from our Azure Database for Postgres flexible server session. In this one, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into using Postgres extensions in Azure. I'm your host, Brian Hitney, a CSA focused on data and analytics, and our expert is Gennady Kostinsky, senior PM on the Azure DB engineering team, who has graciously offered to come back to dive into Postgres extensions. Now, as an overview, if you're new, our Data Academy, which is at aka.ms slash ADA, our data-centric presentations, we're going to cover everything from SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, Cosmos DB, very similar to our Modern Analytics Academy series, which is at aka.ms slash MAA. You can find this and all of our other content in our repo at aka.ms slash partner readiness and we welcome your feedback so if you have other sessions you'd like to see your comments on this session uh, let us know you could give feedback directly through our github repo or through our office form which is aka.ms slash ada feedback without further ado i'll turn it right over to Gennady. Gennady, it's all yours thanks sir and uh, my name is Gennady kostinsky i'm a senior pm in azure postgres sql team you might know. Uh, today we're gonna look at uh, Postgres SQL extensions and what are they, what do they do, how to work with them, and how they're an important part of Postgres that make it more than just a relational database, but what people call an object relational database. So that's an agenda today. I kind of already stated. We're gonna look at extensions, categories, how they're supported, uh, how the, uh, the developers create extensions, some of the most popular extensions, things with Postgres, and um, how we support them in our PaaS offering as a flexible servant, uh, Azure. Well, the real big name is Azure Database for Postgres SQL Flexible Server. Uh, so let's talk about extensions. So the idea is that Postgres is unique. So there's a there's a idea of a plugin for extensions that are can be plugged into the engine and starting version 9.1 these extensions could override your typical database module behavior like your your engine default behavior and then uh, when you use the uh, the syntax called create extension with extension name you essentially download an extension install it and then you install it inside the engine or plug it in inside the engine by doing create extension extension name it dynamically loads that extension into the postgres address space so they're running in process to postgres uh, in a lot of ways that's great because uh, the performance overhead of an extension is is great it's very small because they're running within uh, postgres address space uh, but it also makes them a bit uh, as you understand a bit dangerous uh, because uh, if their extension is not correctly written or has an error or some sort of an issue, it can actually take down the Postgres itself. So Postgres, that's the beauty of it. That's why people call it object relational database. Like it's, it's really, really extendable. Not just what can you extend with it, uh, but writing your own functionality. Well, you can, you can build your own type system and your own operators. You can do uh, user-defined functions and ag aggregates. Uh, you can extend a storage system and some indexing. We'll talk about it. Right ahead logging, which is what people in other operating systems call or other other databases call uh, transaction logging and indexing. Uh, replication, uh, transaction engines, background worker processes, query planner. There's, so it's obviously possible to write an extension that that uh, changes the way that the query plan is interpreted or queries execution is done. Um, configuration, database metadata. So there's there's thousands right now of extensions. These are usually created and maintained by community. You'll find all kinds of repositories in, in GitHub. And uh, these extensions, some of them actually change the product quite a bit. So uh, Postgres can can become a completely different database <laughs> in, a, in a way its behavior is. Uh, just by installing a plugin extension. So how do folks do develop these extensions? Well, first they they kind of develop the code, they debug it, they test it within the Postgres, they package it, and then they release it on GitHub. So that's kind of a 
your typical extension development life cycle. Of course, uh, a lot of these extensions become become very popular, in which case there's versioning introduced minor and major versioning. And um, some of the major versions align to major versions of Postgres. So give an example, uh, you know, even the majority of the extensions are backward compatible. Some of the extensions like timescale, let's say uh, the newer versions of it don't work with the older versions of Postgres and so on. So it's important to look at versioning as well. So where and how and what and, and how do you categorize these extensions? So the extensions come in, in particular categories. As I said, there are extensions that are so popular and so well known. They essentially are shipped together with Postgres. They're called contrib extensions or contributor extensions. So, and these extensions are developed uh, and shipped with versions of Postgres. So as you get a new version of Postgres, you get uh, a new version of an extension in a contrib folder with it under contrib directory. Uh, so obviously these extensions are, are a lot easier and a lot safer to implement because they get tested together with a new version by community. So as the new version of Postgres comes in, uh, these contrib extensions get tested with it. So it's a lot, it's the same kind of a life cycle that Postgres has, so it's a lot easier to uh, to, to kind of keep track of them, test them, and I'm sure they're a lot more safer uh, and secure as well. Then there's custom extensions, not to say that these are not safe, but they're developed independently by developers. And these extensions um, are installed independently of Postgres, so the Postgres doesn't come with them. And they can be installed independently and then loaded with the create extension and then pretty much ran. But the versioning there is not uh, is not coinciding with the versioning of Postgres SQL. So uh, major versions of the extensions can come uh, independent of Postgres SQL version. Um, so I, there's a couple of ways. So you, you kind of take these custom extensions, drop them on a box, you do a make install or make. And then the required files are copied to particular uh, to an installation uh, directory, and then you just run create extension, which loads that extension into Postgres SQL. Uh, there's a couple of files that every extension typically has. There's SQL and control files. Once you install it, that are placed in shar uh, shared extension directory under Postgres, and there's a DOL files that are that have to be placed in the lib directory because as we stated, these extensions run in process. So these are dynamic lib libraries that run in process. All right, a typical uh, custom extension example, not the one that's placed under contrib is a PG cron, for example. So number of products like SQL Server has a test scheduler built into them. Um, Postgres does not have a test scheduler. Uh, but you do need to schedule maintenance, other tasks in, you know, with the database. For that, um, Citus, uh, which is a separate company at one point that actually Microsoft purchased uh, uh, later, uh, created an extension called PG Cron. And essentially that is an extension that kind of mimics the Cron, which is the test scheduler in Linux, only it runs inside Postgres. And can schedule Postgres uh, Postgres jobs within within the databases. It's open source, and uh, it, it's pretty simple to schedule things right inside a database with SQL statements, as you can tell, can see in uh, examples. Like to run a vacuum in Postgres every day at ten, you would just use the cron schedule function and, and kind of provide provide the per parameters, time parameters, and, and a date parameters, so, and run it. Other popular extensions include timescale DB. It just tells you how extensions can, can make your typical, what you would say, a relational database, that's why we call Postgres object relation database, behaving very differently. Um, so uh, timescale is the Postgres for time series, so it's built to run time series um, type of workloads um, 
and uh, to store time series data, right? Which is not very easy to store in your typical relational database. Um, both GIS and other uh, type of data that's not easy to store in uh, in a relational database, which is uh, geographic objects, uh, and trying to kind of grab location data. Um, that's not easy in a relational database. That's why the post GIS makes it easy to store such spatial data. Um, another interesting one is the uh, uh, Zombo DB. We have customers use it. Uh, for example, that mimics more of a kind of a textual search in Postgres, sort of like Elastic. Uh, it actually uses Elastic um, under the covers, you know, once you install it, to kind of bring in all the powerful text search and analytics indexing uh, into Postgres. A Postgres uh, foreign data wrappers, there's a gazillion of these. Uh, you have Postgres FDW, Oracle FDW, and such. This, uh, you know, GSQL FDW, I mean, there's a gazillion of them. Uh, the, the foreign data wrappers, what they allow you is to access tables on a remote uh, database servers. For Postgres FDW, that's Postgres. For Oracle FDW, that's Oracle. And kind of and kind of essentially query these remote servers in kind of a data virtualization way. Um, so you can you can use uh, Postgres sort of a front end to these back end databases. So, you know, there's lots of popular extensions. These are just some of the most popular ones that allow you kind of kind of do more than your regular relational database can do. In a flexible server today, we support 45 extensions. Obviously, uh, the contributor extensions, uh, we support all of them. As far as third-party extensions, we don't support all the third-party extensions because there are some so-called unsafe language extensions that one cannot support as a on a PaaS environment, right? Um, now, these extensions run, as I said, in process. So we kind of reserve our right to kind of debug them for customers and we find some issues. We reserve the right as part of the support to ask customers to uninstall these extensions, obviously, if they're not safe for one reason or another. Um, but we also work with extension publishers and the community to test them and to make sure that they're safe. And if we find something, we definitely, we definitely, definitely report it to extension publisher as well. So currently, a user can see available extensions um, by simply running show Azure extensions in 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 the Azure Flexible Server, uh, Postgres Flexible Server, and. We'll, we'll show you a, a large extension string that will kind of explain, you know, show you every extension that you can install. For security reasons, for some of the financial customers, we allowed kind of a feature that you have to allow list the extension before you can use it. So right now, I'm just going to show you, um, you know, uh, how you allow list and use an extension in in inside, you know, our PaaS offering. Uh, Azure Database for Postgres SQL. So here I have a, a server, which is a Postgres PaaS server. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and uh, find a PostGIS extension and I'll all list it. I'm just going to go find extensions. Here's like Azure extensions parameter in my parameters. And I'm going to find a PostGIS extension which is, if you remember, the extension that allows me to use spatial data inside the database. So I'm going to kind of take all these post-GIS extensions and allow them. And then you know, let's just save my results. While I'm doing that, I am going to go to PG Admin. And uh, I already logged into this database before. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create this extension. Now that I allow listed this extension, I can do it uh, easily. All right, the extensions are created. I mean, I might as well create all of them, but I don't need all of them really. I just need the post GIS. Um, now I'm going to create a table which holds the geometry data types, which you know, which is what Post GIS is all about. It's all about, you know, storing spatial columns. So 
that's it. Create an index, which is also, you notice it's using gist, which is something the PostGIS allows me to do. Insert a record in there. I don't know much to insert, but I'm inserting a 0, .00. <laughs> I mean, there's not much to insert there. So, but the idea is that it's inserted. And then, you know, now I can select this record using uh, within function. So I'm saying, find me something within this record within point zero zero. So if if the PostGIS wasn't be wouldn't be here, uh, this obviously would not come back quickly like this or would not even be available. So that's the whole idea that within a few minutes, I can now, um, you know, I can now go in and create, uh, uh, turn my typical relational database into what essentially is a, a, a spatial database. So that's kind of where we, for a quick demo. So hopefully this is just the beginning of your extension journey. Hopefully you can look at the extensions as you need them. Look at timescale, look at PG stat, look at a lot of those popular extensions that I mentioned and experiment with those as, uh, you know, if you're an app dev folks, it will allow you to use uh, Postgres in some new and innovative ways for your applications. Thank you. Thank you, Kanadi. That's great information. Thank you, everybody, for attending today's presentation. Once again, you can find our content, aka.ms slash ADA, and uh, your feedback is most uh, appreciated, which you can leave directly in our repo or through our feedback form, aka.ms slash ADA-feedback. Thanks again for attending, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next session.